Hi, everyone. Happy Father's Day, and thank you for joining us. And a special shout out to Alder Grove CLCC. I trust you're having a wonderful Sunday. Today, we're beginning a brand new series called The Truth About Lies, Navigating the Things That Form Us. Well, I want to talk about the world, the flesh, and the devil. But actually, that's normally the way we describe the opposition that we feel in this world. But actually, we're going to approach it from a different angle. We're going to talk about the devil, the flesh, and the world. Well, the church is at war against lies. It, it always has, and it always will be until Jesus returns. This has been the case since the very beginning. Satan lied to Eve, of course, in the garden. And in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus says about the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So the Apostle Paul often uses warfare terminology to describe our journey. Put on the full armor of God, Ephesians 6.13. Fight the good fight, 1 Timothy 6.12. Take captive every thought, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. You know, although we are perhaps less comfortable with warfare terminology today, it, it certainly is used by the Apostle Paul, and we certainly can see that there is a comparison between the battle that we're in and warfare. Now, every battle has an offensive and a defensive strategy. Our offensive strategy as followers of Jesus is in our witness. It's in the gospel. It's in us sharing the good news and telling our stories and doing uh, good works and, ever, and endeavoring to use our gifts to bless people and to bring people to Jesus. But we're focusing on this series on our defensive strategy, our defense against lies. Ephesians 6, verse 11 and 12 are our passage of scripture for today. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Let's pray. So, Father, thank you that you have equipped us to counteract the lies of the enemy, the lies of our flesh, the lies of this world. Help us, Lord, in this series to see the importance of the truth and help us to stand firmly on your truth as we counteract, as we encounter the lies that the devil has uh, been using and is using today to come against your people and the, uh, the formation of the kingdom of God in this world. So Lord, I pray that you would help us, give us divine insight and divine power to demolish strongholds. In your name we pray, amen. It is a battle to remain faithful and keep following Jesus. I would like you to take a look, if you can, at John Mark Comer's book, Live No Lies. And uh, that's a great resource if you want to read more about this. And some of his ideas have prompted our prayers and our thoughts in this series. So we're talking about the world, the flesh, and the devil, or the devil, the flesh, and the world. Now, when we talk about the world... We're referring to the prevailing opinions or the worldview of those who don't follow Jesus or of those who are antagonistic to a Christian worldview. So we're not just talking about people who are just uh, uh, haven't chosen to follow Jesus, but there are actually people in our world today who are antagonistic to the church, antagonistic to the Bible, antagonistic to a Christian worldview. And so when we talk about the world, we, we talk about those people and those ideas that uh, are antagonistic to the things of God. When we talk about the flesh, we're really referring to our disordered desires, our desires that are out of sync with the Holy Spirit and who Jesus wants us to be. These disordered desires, the, the flesh, is, is also destructive to us. It's, it's soul impoverishing. So those who follow the disordered desires, although it appears to be a good thing, in the end, there's destruction. It's soul defeating, soul impoverishing. And when we talk about the devil, we're referring to our enemy. We're not referring to people, but to our enemy, the devil the source of all evil and temptation. The Bible describes our enemy, the devil, Satan, as powerful, evil, and cunning. 
And we are to stand against his schemes. This is what Ephesians 6, 12 is telling us. Now, the Bible talks about the many schemes that Satan has. He has a scheme to trip us up with temptation and accusation and at times intimidation, at times deception, and at times division. Now, I'm not sure that our Western culture takes the devil very seriously. In fact, when we think about it, I don't think many people are thinking uh, much about evil or the presence of evil in our culture. Now, we know that other countries in the world perhaps uh, spend more time thinking about this. And, and C.S. Lewis warns us that there's, there's two extremes that we can fall into. The one extreme is an overzealous um, uh, desire to know everything that the devil is doing and perhaps an over, overly focusing on the devil and his screams. The other extreme is to ignore his presence and to not realize that he is actively involved in endeavoring to deceive the world. I think that uh, the North American church and North American in general is probably erring on the side of we really don't take his influence seriously enough, nor do we stand up against his schemes. And this is what the Apostle Paul is encouraging us to do in Ephesians chapter 6. So in this series, we'll be focusing on his deception, this, this one of his tactics that he uses in order to defeat God, defeat the church, defeat the followers of Jesus. So here's the progression of how he works. First of all, he creates a deceptive idea, and then that idea appeals to our disordered desires. And then that idea that appeals to the disordered desires becomes normalized in sinful society or in the world. We could use many examples to illustrate this, but, but think, for example, of Nazi Germany. Uh, the, the lie that the devil started was this idea that Jewish people were somehow interfering with the economy, that they somehow were dragging the, the German uh, economy down uh, into a wasteland, and that uh, they were somehow uh, subhuman. Their, their, their personhood was not the same as the personhood of the, of the Germanic people that lived in that area. And so, so this, this deception appealed to the uh, disordered desires because people thought, well, if we got rid of Jewish people, then all of those shops and all those businesses that are owned by them would become ours. And, and that's very appealing to disordered desires, to, to selfishness. And that then, then that became normalized in society so that, so that intelligent German people even German people who professed Christ uh, developed a system where they would transport Jewish people to gas chambers and, and kill them and then incinerate their bodies. I mean, it's almost unthinkable, but we see the progression of the, of the deception appealing to the flesh and then becoming normalized in society. Another example would be Jim Crow laws before the Civil War. Jim Crow laws were laws put in place in the southern United States, which segregated uh, African-American people from white society. So they had separate water fountains, they had separate entrances to uh, theaters, separate places to eat. Uh, those Jim Crow laws uh, forced uh, African-Americans to sit at the back of the bus, for example. And, and all of those things, they were, they were put together by people who were, who were deceived by the enemy. It appealed to their, uh, their lower selves, to their disordered selves, and it became normalized in the culture. The lies then become weaponized against the church. So let me give you an example of that. Let, let's talk for a moment about the, uh, the, the, the thought that God is dead. Uh, this was perhaps first proposed by Friedrich Nietzsche in the mid-19th century. He was a philosopher who basically taught because of the rise of science and our understanding of how things really work, there is no longer any need in people's thinking for God. So, so the lie at the beginning was that, that God does not exist because science has proven that he doesn't need to be there in order to understand how the world operates. So the lie could be that maybe he created the world, but now he's gone away. 
So this appeals to the flesh because the flesh says, our disordered desire says, well, if there is no God, then there is no moral authority. Then I can do whatever I think best. I become the determinator, the arbitrator, the, ones who, the one who can decide right from wrong. And this becomes normalized in society because then society begins to believe that no longer do we appeal to the Bible, no longer can we appeal to God's moral law. We can decide right from wrong. And this is weaponized against the church because if you believe otherwise, if you believe other than what society believes, other than what this lie has been uh, promulgating in society, then you're judgmental. You, you are, if you think otherwise, then you're old-fashioned. And so that's what I mean when, when this life comes full circle and becomes used against the church. Well, currently, I think there's a deception in our culture today, in our North American culture, particularly maybe in Western culture generally, that, that this deception is rooted in this idea that there's a hostility between uh, our inner selves and our physical bodies. And, and this is really uh, Gnosticism reborn. Gnosticism was a heresy that was present in the early church. The Apostle Paul addresses this in some of his letters. It's the idea that there is a dualism between the material world and the spiritual world, and that the material world is evil and the spiritual world is good. So therefore, uh, we can, uh, as long as we live this spiritual life, it doesn't matter what happens in the physical world because uh, the physical world is evil anyway. Whenever people pit their true self over against their biological self, it's a form of Gnosticism. It's the ancient lie of the enemy. And we have to be careful of that one. I think that's rampant in our culture today. So we need to be aware. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So to a certain extent, we need to be aware of Satan's schemes. So we, we can't be ignorant, in other words. We need to be aware that Satan is at work in our world, that he deceives people. This appeals to people's flesh. It ends up becoming normalized in society, and this is weaponized against the church to try to prove that the church is somehow out of step with reality. But not only do we need to be aware, we also need to be empowered to defeat this. And this is what this scripture is about. Ephesians 6.12 is about empowerment. It says, put on the full armor of God. Ignorance and weakness are to be avoided. It says in our text that we struggle not against flesh and blood. In other words, uh, people are not our enemies. Uh, it's the enemy and it's the philosophies and the powers, the spiritual power behind the lies that are the enemies of the things of God and the people of God. When it says we struggle here, the, the literal word here is wrestle. And the imagery is in hand-to-hand, uh, -hand, face to face Greco-Roman wrestling. So we are in a struggle, a hand-to-hand -hand combat with evil forces, a spiritual power encounter. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. And he tells us that we are to put on the armor of God and stand firm. And otherwise, we are to oppose this spiritually. Remember, we're not opposing people. We're opposing a spiritual force, a spiritual principle. Whether by force or by fraud, the devil intends to do things in the world. He intends to discourage he intends to create disillusionment, and he intends to create distance from God. Be aware. And wobbly Christians are in danger when all this is going on. And notice that in our text, the emphasis is on standing strong, standing firm. Put on the armor of God so that you can take your stand. Chapter 6, verse 11. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand, that's chapter 6, verse 13. And then it says again in chapter 6, verse 14, stand firm then. Well, the weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. They're not physical. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. With this in mind, we need to be alert and always keep on praying.
and to pray in the Spirit, the Apostle Paul says near the end of, of this passage of Scripture. We are to pray intelligently, understanding that the devil has a scheme to deceive, that he is the father of lies, that he has a plan in place to distort the truth and cause havoc in the world. It's not a plan to make the world better. It's not a plan to make the world stronger. It's not a plan to help the world. It's a plan to destroy the world. And the people of God and the power of the Spirit is to come against that and stand firm so that the world can know Jesus Christ as Lord. And Jesus Christ is the best way to live. Jesus Christ shows us the best, truest, most beautiful way to live. And so as followers of Jesus, our job in the midst of all of this is not only to be aware that the devil has a scheme, but also to counteract it through our prayer life. So I'd encourage you to pray. Pray without ceasing, as Scripture says. Pray in the Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to give you the kinds of things to say and to be open to the Holy Spirit in His uh, ability to pray through us and, and give us the things to pray so that we come against the enemy and we defeat the lies of the enemy. So that's what we're going to be talking about in this series, the devil, the flesh, and the world. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would enable us to truly be the kind of people who defeat the enemy's spiritual power. Lord, we recognize that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people, but it's against spiritual forces. It's against rulers. It's against powers and principalities. It's about the enemy who seeks to deceive and seeks to destroy and seeks to intimidate. Lord, help us in our prayer lives that we would be aware of this. Lord, make us more aware that you have called us into this battle. Lord, forgive us for at times we, we forget that there is a spiritual battle that is raging all around us. And Lord, help us to be willing to be on the front line and to truly wrestle with these issues and to pray in the Spirit, to pray that you would defeat the enemy. Lord, so help us to stand firm, help us to stand our ground. In your name we pray these things for your honor and glory. Amen. Here's a question of the day I'd like you to ponder. Do you think we take the existence of the devil seriously enough? Can you pray that we become more aware of the enemy's schemes and counter them with prayer? In the first century, combat was hand-to-hand. -hand. <laughs> there was nothing like uh, the battles today where people can be pushing buttons at a distance and guided missiles are going out or people are shooting rockets with uh, handheld instruments or guns or anything like that. It was hand-to-hand -hand in the trenches, people standing face-to-face. -face. And, and in those kinds of battles, your footing is absolutely essential because... Uh, as you can imagine, the, the battlefield, uh, if it had rained or perhaps because of uh, what had been going on in the battlefield, it wouldn't become too graphic, but the ground could be very slippery. And to fall down was the end. And so one of the most important pieces of equipment that every soldier had was 
their shoes, their boots. In fact, they wore hobnailed boots, spikes in the bottoms of their shoes so that they would grip solidly as they pushed against the enemy because to fall was actually uh, your end. And uh, Ephesians chapter 6, 15 says this, And having strapped on your feet the gospel of peace in preparation to face, to face the enemy, firm-footed stability, and the readiness produced by the good news. That's the amplified version. So what Paul is saying is that part of our armor, part of our equipment that we need to have as we struggle in this battle is good footwear. And the footwear is our preparation to share the gospel. In other words, your willingness to witness, your willingness to share your story of faith, your willingness to speak the good news of Jesus to others is actually what helps you keep a firm footing in this battle against the enemy. It gives you confidence, in other words, to stand up against his many different kinds of assaults. And so I would encourage you, have you witnessed for the Lord lately? Have you spoken up for Jesus? Have you shared with anybody your story of the good news of Jesus Christ in your life? This is, in fact, what gives you confidence and strength to stand your ground against the enemy. So something that you do, such as, which is very physical, is speaking the truth and love to people, is what actually helps you defeat the enemy spiritually. That's important to remember. Our doxology for this series is found in Romans chapter 11, verse 33 and 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The Lord bless you. Have a wonderful week. Don't forget to pray.